Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? My name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with us today. We had a fresh dusting of snow last night, which is nice, brightens everything up. We have vehicles running all over the place right now because we are going to feed the cows this morning. We're going to plow the driveway this morning. We also have to move the van that's parked up there because it's in the way of the plow truck as well as the farm truck over here. We have to get everything moved out of the way so we can get all of the snow taken off the driveway. Today I am going to be answering as many of the questions I can from last week's video. I think it was last week where I said that we would be doing a Q&A and you guys asked us so many awesome questions so I thought as we go about our day today I would answer them for you. I got the cook stove lit this morning and all polished up. I tried a new trick that I was reading about the other day, which was to use olive oil. I guess I could actually leave these open since we're going to run the tractor through here in a minute. But um, I tried using olive oil as a polish. I used to use something called blacking, but there's a lot of chemicals in there and it smells really bad. So I wanted to try something natural. And so far it seems to be working. It did shine it up nicely. And then I lit the stove so that it can be all nice and hot so that I can get supper made early today. We have a busy day today. And like I've mentioned before, I like to get supper done in the morning if I can. And lots of people ask me always when I say that, what do I do? Do I just put it, pop it in the fridge? This time of year, I actually just put it outside on the freezer. And sometimes if it's cold enough, it'll actually be frozen. And then I just reheat it in the oven around an hour before I want to sit down for supper. And then it's ready to eat at supper time. And one of the questions that you guys asked was regarding the cows or all of our livestock and if it's difficult to sell them or when it's time to process, if we find that hard. And when I first started raising livestock, I guess that would be, when did I get my first animals? I think about 15 years ago now or so. I found it more difficult for the first couple of years. But now that we've been doing it for so long, I don't find it difficult anymore. And as far as selling animals, as long as I know they're going to a good home, I'm fine with it. Normally we don't sell animals unless we know it's the right decision for our farm. So it's fine. Uh, one of the questions that we get asked a lot is how we deal with really cold temperatures with our livestock. And uh, I do have a really thorough video on that that I'll put down in the show notes for you and up here. And if you want to check that out to just get more detailed information. One of the biggest challenges in the winter time when it comes to the cold temperatures is frozen water tanks. So what we do for that is we use tank heaters. So these are just plugged in to the barn and they keep the water tanks thawed out. One of the other challenges with watering in the winter is occasionally having frozen hydrants. And that's what we have here. As you can see, there's no water coming out. So we're gonna show you what we do to thaw these. And the only way this trick works is if it hasn't frozen down below the ground. If it's frozen down below the ground, then uh, this will be frozen until spring. And we'll just end up having to bucket water from our other hydrant that's down here. So the reason that uh, hydrants like this can freeze is if they aren't closed all the way, which is what happened in this case. It just was up just a tiny little bit. It hadn't been pushed right down and the water got up in here and froze. And because it's been fairly warm, we're fairly confident we'll be able to um, get this thawed out. Now it's time to feed the cows. That's one of the other things we have to do in the winter that we don't have to do in the summer. We have enough pasture for our cows in the summertime, but of course they don't have good feed here in the winter, so we feed them out. So what we're doing here is just removing all the twine that holds the hay bales together. This can cause a pretty serious issue, of course, if it gets into the intestines of cows or horses. So we always try to make sure that we get rid of all of it. the 
not frozen at all, hey? Just frozen up at the top that time. Well, that's awesome. Sometimes we end up having to run that tiger torch for 20 minutes before it'll actually thaw it, but it must have just been frozen right up here. That's great. Is this still hot? Is the handle still hot? That's hot. Yeah. Dan was just saying it's so nice because this morning everything's just working and turning on. It is only zero degrees right now, so it's quite warm. And usually when it's really cold, he has to get pretty creative with getting the machines going. So yeah, it's, it's nice when everything just works. Many people asking about our story and how we kind of got here, how long we've been together, how old we are and things like that. So I'll answer those questions for you. I'm 45 and Dan is 46. We're a year and a couple months apart. We met in high school when I was just about 15 and he had just turned 16. So we started dating in high school and we were pretty much thick as thieves and inseparable all throughout high school. And then we had our first child when I was 19 and Dan was 20. We got married when I was, was I 19? I must have been 19 or maybe just turned 20. Yeah, I think that's when it was, so 20, 19 or 20. Um, we got married then. We have been together for 31 years. We celebrate our anniversary on the 21st of February. We actually celebrate when we started dating because we got so serious right away. We didn't get married until 1997, but we started dating in 1992. Lots of people asking whether we had always wanted to homestead or whether both of us had wanted to. And no, definitely not. Dan uh, wasn't, it wasn't even really on his radar. I was raised with a mom who canned and gardened. Uh, when I was really young, we had chickens and honeybees. So I don't remember that really, but it definitely played a part in, in forming my um, idea about what I wanted my future to look like. So it must've been a really positive experience. And Dan grew up, his dad owned restaurants his whole life and his mom is an artist and she worked. So we had very different upbringings, but um, I always had a really clear idea of wanting to have a farm and have a large family and raise a lot of our own food and things like that. And Dan, he says, if you were to ask him, he would say, I loved you so much that I just wanted to support your dreams. And I think I'm really lucky that way because he has done that. He has been very supportive of all of my dreams and over the years I would say that he has come to really appreciate all the home cooked food and there's lots of elements of homesteading that he really enjoys. Um, if you've been around our channel for a while you've probably seen that we have lots of machines and tools and things like that and he loves that aspect of it and enjoys haying and, and that whole thing. I do you think for me I've thought a lot about this because there's a lot of dreams that Dan has that aren't fulfilled within this lifestyle that we are hoping to do. And it's really important to me to do that because Dan has such a, done such an amazing job at supporting my dreams. I really want to help him to be able to have some of his dreams fulfilled. One of those being this old car that I've talked about before. This was Dan's car when he was 16. I've shared a story about this on a different video, which I'll link for you. But um, restoring this car is another dream of Dan's. So I'm really hoping to see that be able to be fulfilled in the next couple of years. Several of you asked about whether we thought our kids would continue on with this lifestyle or um, you know, live here as they became adults. And I would say that for my seven kids that are left, that are still home, that are young and they're still home, they grew up here on this farm for the most part. We've had this farm for just about eight years. And even prior to that, we still lived a very farmy kind of lifestyle for a few years. So for most of their formative development years and all the way now through their teen years, they have grown up on a farm. So I think they are much more likely and they all talk about wanting to build cabins on the property, um, several of them want to do farming type ventures like gardening, farmers markets and things like that. They are definitely more um, inclined in that direction. But my four oldest kids definitely want to live in town. I would say Kate, who is my 20 year old, she, I could see her having a milk cow. She loves, loves, loves milk cows. I could see her having a milk cow when she's older, but she definitely wants to do some traveling and some adventuring first. She's actually leaving to go overseas at the beginning of January for a couple of months and wants to do that whole thing. And then she's gonna do school and all of that. Um, my two older boys 
have zero interest in the farm life at all. But the irony of that is my oldest son's partner, Emmy Jo, who you guys have met, she really likes animals and is already talking about, they have a couple of acres and she's talking about getting some ducks and goats maybe and that sort of thing. And my oldest, my oldest son, Ben, is like, no, <laughs> but I know he loves her and will probably support her to um, do that when their son is a little bit older. So that would, that would kind of give me a little bit of a chuckle because I know Ben isn't really interested in farm life that much. Sure, uh, yeah, so I would say that um, for children that are brought up in a homesteading lifestyle, I think they're far more likely to carry it on than for those that, are, um, that were raised in town and then moved, moved out to a farm. At least that's been our experience. We are now ready to go do some plowing. Do you want me to go up and move the van? The girls asked this morning if they could make sweet crepes. So you remember the other day how I made those savory crepes with the cheese sauce, broccoli, corn, and cauliflower. They want to make a sweet whipping cream and berry filled crepe this morning. So we'll pop in and see how they're doing with that. They have those in hand. Kate's in there giving them a hand, so that's good. They're making strawberry crepes. They're going to be delicious, I can't wait. It's a little slippery. I was hoping to get a lesson in driving this plow truck. Before we had this plow truck, I plowed with a tractor, which I got pretty good at over a couple of years, but I haven't had a lot of experience or any experience at all driving this. Wow, it's a big steering wheel. <laughs> truck is multi-purpose for us in the winter it's a plow truck and in the summer it is the truck that we haul all our gravel from our gravel pit with and how much did this cost this was like the best investment it was so good yeah so this was three thousand dollars that's how much money we spent yeah this was one of our very best ever farm investments outside of just a basic tractor so i got down to uh, come out onto the main road just because I don't have enough experience to be driving this big huge thing on the main road. So we're just going to turn it back around and head back down the driveway. Dan was just saying that if you ever um, have a property with a really long driveway, so ours is two kilometers long, then buying something like this is a really worthwhile investment. <laughs> we bought this from the company that maintains all the roads in our area. So you can usually get them for fairly inexpensive or at auctions too. So what he does is just to make sure that when we're plowing out on our driveway that we don't leave big ridges of snow on the main road for other people that are coming down this way or up of course. You can see where he just plowed, has, there's that big ridge of snow so he's just going to work on this until it's nice and smooth. Lots of questions about what we do for a living and if we have an off-farm income. So we have always had uh, other incomes outside of farming and Dan was just saying that he doesn't know of a farmer, he has lots of farming friends, as do I, that um, doesn't have some kind of secondary income or creative ways to be able to make money and that is the same for us. Dan has always worked off of the farm. He started out in automotive mechanics was ticketed in that, then became a heavy duty commercial transport mechanic and was ticket ticketed in that and then moved into management. And that's what he was doing before he came home two months ago. 
Anyways, I'll finish that story once we get back. I'm gonna drive this big beast again. And it's so bad in second. Well, I feel much better now that I know how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna go inside, see how breakfast is coming along, and get supper going. And answer some more of your guys' questions. I would love a crepe. That sounds amazing. Oh, you did a nice job. They look good. This looks so good. You guys did such a nice job. These are beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. So what we're gonna make for dinner tonight is my twist on biscuits and gravy. Normally biscuits and gravy are made with ground pork, but I am using ground beef today. I'm just gonna fry up three pounds of beef here. Where were we in the Q&A? Oh right, I was talking about Dan and work. So I think I explained what he had done um, for work before. So he has now he's now home and working from home. I am doing YouTube more, as you've probably noticed, I'm putting lots of content out. When I first started doing YouTube five years ago, I started it as a hobby and as a creative outlet for myself. And I knew that one day when my kids were older, my youngest was I think a year old or 18 months old or something like that when I started doing YouTube, that um, when my kids got older that I would eventually like to move it into, uh, from a hobby to a job. And so Dan and I two months ago decided that the time was right for doing that. And so we just jumped in with both feet and did it. And it has been absolutely incredible. Your support has been amazing. We're so incredibly grateful for all of you that have subscribed and like our videos and comment and are just the most wonderful community that's kind of formed up around this channel. And I'm really, really grateful. So thank you so much for that. So I think that answers that question. The questions I answered, how long we live here, how many kids we have, did we both wanna live on a farm? Um, one of the questions is how many acres we have. We have 160 acres. We use about 40 of those acres and the rest is forested. We do have plans to convert some areas that we logged about three years ago or so, no, maybe four years ago now, into some pasture. But yeah, we, we really only use about 40 acres. <clears throat> I like this question. Why do we stay living in a cold climate with a short growing season if I don't like the cold and I love gardening so much? I've thought a lot about this because we have talked about living or moving to a warmer climate in the past, but it's been interesting for me to follow other people who live in Southern climates. And there are a lot of challenges to gardening in warmer climates, climates with higher humidity um, than there are growing up here. So for instance, we don't have tomato blight here. We don't have extreme heat for the most part. The last few summers we have had some extreme heat waves, but it doesn't stay hot all summer which allows us to grow colder crops better. Things like brassicas grow really well here. Root vegetables grow really well here. Um, our summers are hot enough that I can still grow things like squash that need a little bit of heat. And um, tomatoes, I do need t a high tunnel for growing tomatoes, but I can still grow them here. And we don't have bug pressure the same way that um, some of you in Southern climates have. So I don't have squash vine borer for instance, which is a huge plague for a lot of people that are growing squash in other places. So, so even though the growing season is really short and kind of intense, I can still grow a lot of food in the climate. So I actually don't mind the, the gardening season. A little bit longer would be nice if I could have it be a little bit warmer for a couple of months in the autumn. That would be amazing and not have frost so early. But um, for the most part, I actually don't mind gardening in this area. We also have a lot of our family that lives in this area. So both of our, my mom and Dan's mom, they both live close to us. My oldest son, his partner and our grandson live close to us. And that's not something that we would want to um, sacrifice at this point. 
lots of questions about whether we ever go on holidays or if Dan and I ever get to go on dates. And Dan and I try to go out at least once every month, it, sometimes every couple of weeks, but at least once a month we go out on a date. And Dan and I both love, love, love to travel. We haven't been able to do any international travel. When's the last time we went on a trip? I think about five years ago where we actually went, um, you know, somewhere exotic, <laughs> far away. But we do try to do camping or even if we just go away for a couple of days to another town, get a hotel, experience whatever that town has to offer. We really do try to do that at least a couple of times a year. We do try to have our teenagers be able to travel internationally at least once during their teen years. So all four of our adult kids have done some travel internationally. Um, one of our older sons lived in Israel actually for a year and our daughter is on her way to Europe in January and she's going to be spending a couple of months there. So we really do love to travel and it's such an amazing experience for kids to be able to see other parts of the world and the way other people live. It really helps to kind of expand their um, base of understanding about the world, which I think is particularly important these days. Lots of questions about what I do for kind of self-care. And I've talked about this before. I wasn't very good at this when my kids were younger. I think it is hard to do self-care when you have really young kids that just need you all the time. But um, as my kids have gotten older, that's gotten a little bit easier. So one of the things that I do is I have a nap or a rest of some sort every single afternoon after lunchtime. And that's my opportunity to recharge. And it does wonders for my energy in the afternoon. I get up early before all of my kids do so that I have a chance to just kind of plan the day, sit and have some tea. And uh, that also really helps. I always notice whenever I stop doing that, because it kind of ebbs and flows with how good I am about it, whenever I stop doing it, I really do notice a difference in my overall mental health. And our house is really quiet after about eight o'clock at night. Everyone kind of goes off and does their own thing. So Dan and I have time in the evening usually to hang out. Uh, someone asked whether we have a TV, and we do. We have a couple of TVs actually, and my kids are, are all, most for the most part, I think, except for the girls who are making breakfast, because that's what they wanted to do this morning. All the boys are playing video games right now. So we do have video games and movies and all of that. So our ground beef is all browned now. And to this, I'm going to add some flour and I'm also going to add some frozen corn. Okay, to this, I'm going to add some milk. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what I'm going to do is make some baking powder biscuits and I'm just going to make them a little bit runnier than I would usually for baking powder biscuits and I don't use measurements at all when I'm doing um, these ones, where did my measuring cup go? Oh, I'll just use this one. Uh, when I'm making these, I just kind of eyeball it. So probably around four cups of flour, but I will put my baking powder biscuit recipe, the one that's for just the biscuits themselves down in the show notes. And then you just add a little bit more milk to them to make them nice and runny so that they make more of a biscuit topping for the, um, biscuits and gravy. Alrighty, I have my butter mixed in to my flour and I'm gonna just rinse my hands off. Okay, so now I've added some baking powder to this, probably two tablespoons worth. And um, I'm just going to make, oh, actually I forgot to add the salt. That one is an important ingredient. Lots of questions about my cookbook, when and where it'll be available and all kind of the logistics around it. So I have um, brought on some help to create this cookbook. It was definitely a bigger project than I was anticipating. I'm really excited about it though. I'm especially excited because I am sharing my grandmother's recipes in it and my mother's recipes in it. So it's gonna be a family treasure and I love that, that idea. 
It is going to be uh, take a little bit of extra time because we want to make it available on Amazon. We're going to do an ebook for those that don't want a hardcover or for those that live in places in which the shipping would make it prohibitive. And um, we're also going to do a hardcover as well. So I promise that I am working very hard on it. We do have all the recipes all organized and tested and all of that. And now I'm working on the photography part of it. The other thing that we are working on alongside of the cookbook is my website and making my website really functional, developing a newsletter and things like that. So there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes with Little Mountain Ranch, which are all really exciting. And I'm so looking forward to being able to share all of that with you. So I am now just thinning this dough out a little bit because I want it to be a little bit runnier than I would if this was going to be biscuit. So let me show you the texture of this. So as you can see here, it's pretty runny, more like a really thick batter. So now I'm just going to cover the surface of this with our biscuit dough. I guess this is kind of like dumplings, isn't it? And I think I'm gonna serve this with some carrot sticks and whatever other um, canned pickled condiments the kids might like. There is two ways that you could bake this. You could put a lid on it and put it on the stove top and kind of steam these biscuits. But what I'm going to do is pop this into the cook stove oven and bake it in there. I'm also going to put some grated cheese on the top of it and a little bit of smoked paprika. I am going to put the lid on this while it's in the oven for the first little bit and then I'll brown up the top when the biscuits are done cooking. I also want to give you an update on where the freeze dryer room is. It's just looking so beautiful. Okay, so this is where we're at. We painted the floor that brick red that I was talking about before. And we have our shelf here and on the shelf sits the pump. So you can actually hear it because we're running through a test on it right now. So that's about how loud the pump itself is. And then down over here, we have our drain bucket and the drain comes from the freeze dryer down through this hole as does the hose for the pump. And then we have the freeze dryer up here. So I know when I was showing this room before, it looked like it was a lot smaller than it is. So we did make sure that we put lots of adequate ventilation around the freeze dryer. And we also made sure that we insulated this wall and this wall just to protect the rest of the house from the sound of the pump and the freeze dryer running. So this shelf down here, I'm going to use to store all of the things that I need for the freeze dryer, like the oxygen absorbers, the bags, my extra trays. This is actually for filtering the oil. So that'll go there. And then we have my workstation up here for actually bagging up all of the things that I take out of the freeze dryer. And then we have these two shelves up here for storing our freeze dried goods. Such a great thing to be able to share this project with you as we've been doing it, because many of you have freeze dryers already and were able to give us lots of tips and suggestions on how to avoid problems that you came up with as you were putting yours in. One other thing that we're going to be doing in here, like I mentioned, I don't know, in a couple videos ago, is to put a vent into the ceiling that will vent outside so that we can have cold air coming in here so that we can keep this space nice and cool because the freeze dryer does produce quite a bit of heat. Yeah, doesn't it look nice? So happy with it. And I love the way the floor turned out. Looks so beautiful and it's completely cooked and I didn't even need to take the lid off to brown the top. It's all browned and looking gorgeous. Yay! We're not going to eat this until supper time, but I did want to show you what it looks like when it's all scooped up. So there you go, that's what it looks like. And you can put peas in here or carrots or anything else you like too. It's so good. All right, my friends, that is it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.